coming all the way to Kenya. So he studying cryptocurrency. Actually, cryptocurrency you can take a course like masters. He's doing his masters in cryptocurrency and digital currency. By profession, he's an accountant. He was working in DHL in UK. So after he's got his information about cryptocurrency and blockchain and cryptocurrency, so he did a lot of research. So for me also, it's a big privilege to meet him and to learn a lot of things about this technology from him. So he will give us a training or his experience and the technology behind Bitcoin. Please help me, my partner, my brother, Lawrence from Kenya. Hello, no? Hello. You all look good. So I want this to be an interactive session. I don't want this to be like we're in a class, right? So uh, number one, I want everybody to dig deep the, in their hearts and ask them themselves, why are we here? Why did I wake up so early and come here? Why did they wake up so early and come here? Because if you get your why, you'll never miss anything in life, right? So I'm just here to share my experience uh, on blockchain, Bitcoin, and cryptocurrency. It's not really something new to me. Uh, I knew Bitcoin in 2013 when it was around $80. 20. 20. I did nothing. I did nothing. So at times I try to have a good example of missed opportunity when it comes to cryptocurrencies. Uh, especially for us men, we have a disease called analysis paralysis, right? We like researching so much, right? And I went to research for over 18 months. I was researching about crypto for over 18 months. And my wake up call was when I was told to pay my tuition fees in Canada using Bitcoin. Yet I had zero. So I don't want to jump what Bitcoin is before I take you through evolution of trade and money. So that you can understand where we started and where we are headed, right? Everybody can see it from here? Yeah, a little bit ahead. Yeah. We good there? So like you said, I'm Lawrence, former accountant. Uh, accountant. Part time, I'm a journalist. Uh, I run a consultancy firm. I train uh, upcoming media professions on documentaries, not mainstream media. But full time, I'm doing consultancy on blockchain, Bitcoin, and cryptocurrency. Uh, pursuing my master's, um, and it's been an amazing journey. An amazing journey. So today, I want you to open your mind as we learn about blockchain. Digital assets and it's something we cannot leave behind for mining. All three go the same way. So basically for you to understand this, I want to take you through evolution of trade and money. Because if you don't understand history, you won't know where we are heading as a creature. Evolution of trade. Evolution of trade. We all remember that when people started to trade, they were trading goods for goods, right? I come with a cow, you give me some maize, and you're good to go, or some corn. That was the first trade, and it was called butter trade. Evolution of trade, it was butter trade. It had one challenge, <clears throat> lack of divisibility. It was so hard to tell, how much of a cow is worth how many sacks of corn? So people used to trade using trust. It was totally based on trust. I come to her, I tell her I have a goat, I need some corn. It's for us to agree upon, is it 10 bags, or is it 5 bags, or is it 1 bag? If we agree, mutual agreement, peer to peer, we exchange, we deal it at that party. You get it? Now, lack of divisibility led our great-grandfathers to what we call precious metals. 
people started using things like gold. And I tell people, if you go and watch a documentary called Hidden Secrets of Money, you realize that real money was gold. The real money was what? Was gold. But it had one challenge, it, did, it was not a good measure of value. It was not a very good measure of value. Because today I'll give him a whole bar of gold for 20 cows. He goes home and divides the bar into two, comes to her and gives her half and tells her that's what, what? 20 cows. So it was not good measure of what? Measure of value. Second evolution of money came when governments introduced what we call fiat currency. Now, the word fiat is a Latin word that means I declare. I declare. Fiat currency is where we have metal coins and paper money. Paper money. So, government came up with paper that they told us was head value, so we started trading with it. Now, it was good because it sorted one issue of divisibility. You can divide fiat currency into smaller, smaller denominations. The other thing is, it's a good measure of value. If I give you a hundred bill for something, you cannot go and tell somebody else that thing is not is worth more than a hundred bill. So it's a good measure of value. But it had some limits. Number one, you can only use your fiat currency in the country of origin and that's why when i say fiat currency means i declare it's because a government has to declare something has value for you to use it now i cannot use kenya shillings in addis ababa wife the government of ethiopia has not declared kenya shillings as a legal tender so each and every time i need to come here i need to change my kenya shillings to dollars i lose some money it's called cross-border transaction of fees That's number one limitation, that any time you need to change, I have to change my Kenya shillings to dollars, I lose some money. Again, I need to change. Then now, if I have some beer, when I'm going back, again, I have to change to dollars, more money gone. Again, I go and change to Kenya shillings, more money gone. That's number one, cross-border transaction of fees. The other thing is that you can only use your country money in your own country. This is limit of, it's not borderless. Number three limitation is inflation. Inflation. I tell people, if you have a million beer in January and you go to a shop, you want to shop for some goods and you see these are the goods I need to buy with a million beer. If you go there in December and try to take the same goods, what will happen? You're told to add more money, right? Why? Purchasing power of fiat currencies goes down because of inflation. I guess right now we're standing at almost 10% inflation rate every year. 10%. So the money you had last year, though you put it in a bank, earning interest, it's worth less than it was last year. It's worth less than what it was. It was what? Last year because of inflation. Now, the other reason as to why get currency we were forced to go to the that evolution of trade is because of bulkness. I tell people when ATMs were introduced in Nairobi, some people will queue behind you, right? They're not queuing to withdraw money, they are queuing to check how much money you are withdrawing, and then they follow you. By the time you reach your car, everything is gone. Why? Because you're carrying money physically. I tell people, just imagine right now, if we didn't have like pens. One of the challenges fiat currency had is that if I needed to buy a car, like if you live in Venezuela, right, where inflation has gone over 300,000 times. Yeah? How much money do you need to go and buy a car with if you have to carry physically? A whole lot, right? Bulkness. 
And that's why the reason is why we had the dark evolution of money, and it's called plastic cards. This is where we have MasterCard, Visa cards, ATMs, and the rest. Now, one disadvantage of plastic cards is that they have a limit. And some are just limited to your country of origin. Unless you get an international card, you cannot use it out there. And the other limit of plastic cards is the fees you, you pay. They are charges. At times the fees are so high, you can only maybe do a withdraw once or twice a day. It's a whole lot of money. So we went from plastic cards and to the fourth evolution of money, which is electronic money. Electronic money. Now this is where you have things like RTGS, EFTs, Swift, mobile money transfer. Here we have MBIL. In Kenya we have uh, M-Pesa, right? There's one limiting factor I didn't say about plastic cards. You need to be there physically for you to key in your pin number. Otherwise, unless I trust her very much, I can give her my card and my pin number. <coughs> I'll be lucky if my account comes the way I expect it, right? <laughs> Right? She might go and wipe a whole boutique. <laughs> True? Especially for us, man, if you give your lady your card. Yeah? I'm sure even if you're in a meeting, your mind is always thinking, well. <laughs> okay, so that is another limit that you need to be there physically for you to purchase goods and services. Now, electronic money came to solve number one. That element of I can buy a car while I'm seated at home through directing my bank to send a suit or RTGS so I, not, I don't need to be there for mobile money banking I can pay my mom she lives in a different uh, town she can go to a shop shop and tell me Lawrence this is there much I have spent this is a people number I don't need to be physically there and I pay for her shopping it brought convenience electronic money but one thing I'll tell you, with conveniency came fees. Just the other day, a gentleman sent me $300 from UAE. He was charged $35. And I felt a lot of pain because I knew about Bitcoin. Fees. It's crazy fees. And the other thing is, electronic money also is a limit. There's so much you can send using electronic money. Like in Kenya and Pesa, you can only send $700, $700 per transaction, and every day you are limited to $1,400. And for you to send $700, the fees are $5. $5. So these are some of the things that have allowed people to evolve from current physical money, lack of divisibility, that limiting factor of I need to change money from my country to another country. It led to the fifth evolution of money, what we call cryptocurrency. Cryptocurrencies. Now, if you want to go to school and study the science behind cryptocurrencies, you can do a course called cryptography. We have a friend of ours from South Africa. He has a PhD in cryptography. Any person who has studied that, they are called cryptographers. Cryptographers. Now, these are mathematical scientists that derive cryptocurrencies from algorithms. So when you hear of Bitcoin, Ethereum, Monero, Zcash, all these cryptocurrencies are derived from mathematical science based on algorithms based on algorithms so cryptocurrencies this did start just last 2008 i say when you hear about crypto it means encryption which means this is a virtual or digital digital currency crypto encryption it means coding so you cannot see it you cannot touch it but you can transact with it most of us, uh, I believe here, yeah, we have used Ethiopian Airlines. 
right? Most of us. Now, when you travel using Ethiopian airline, they give you something called Sheba Mal. I'm sure nobody has ever touched Sheba Miles or seen Sheba Miles. But if you have enough, you can redeem a ticket. Or even buy goods, redeem for goods and services when you're flying, right? That is a virtual currency. So already you've been using virtual currencies, but you didn't know. The only challenge of Sheba Miles is what we call it centralized. Because I cannot use Sheba Miles in Kenya Airways. I can only use it in Ethiopia Airline. Now, with Bitcoin and other cryptocurrencies, they came to do away with this, so they are decentralized. So I can use Bitcoin anywhere in the world. I can use Ethereum anywhere in the world. I can use Litecoin anywhere in the world. So it's decentralized. It's accepted everywhere. Now, cryptocurrency didn't start in 2008. Cryptographers have been working to get a peer-to-peer -peer, uh, uh, mode of uh, transferring, transferring wealth since the early 80s. But with internet coming in 1992, they formed a group called Cyberpunks, and this is where they started sharing about what? How can we come with a peer-to-peer -peer currency that is borderless? Now, in 2004, the first cryptocurrency, uh, one of the cryptocurrencies came, and it was Ripple, XRP, in 2004. Ripple came even before Bitcoin, but it had one challenge, double spending. I could send her some, bit, uh, some Ripple, and I sent him, and I sent him. The same report. But Satoshi Nakamoto was the brain behind Bitcoin in 2008. October 2008, somebody called Satoshi Nakamoto. Created the white paper that created Bitcoin. And he sent it to all the cryptographers in that group called Cyberpunk. He studied it in December 2008. They sent him an email and told him, you've solved that issue of double spending. That when I send her bitcoins from my wallet, I don't hold those bitcoins with me. She's the only person who is holding them. So I cannot send her the same bitcoins because they have already left my wallet to her wallet. Okay. Now I tell people, for you to deal with cryptocurrencies is something you need, it's called a wallet. It's done like when you're using MBL. You need a, an app, right? That app, app, app is connected to your phone number, right? So for me to send you money through MBL, all I'll ask from you is your phone number, right? Now with Bitcoins and other cryptocurrencies, you have a wallet. This wallet has what we call a wallet address. So you can send someone your wallet address either through a text, WhatsApp or email. Doesn't matter which part of the world they are at, and they are able to send you bitcoins worth whatever money they are sending you. So in January 3rd, 2009, Satoshi Nakamoto issued the first bitcoins, and they were almost worthless. They were equivalent to four zeros and a one. Four zeros and a and a one. Didn't make sense. So a lot of people who are using Bitcoin then were cryptographers, just testing it out. I come, I like your bag, I tell you, I can, ten, I can send you a thousand Bitcoins for your pen. So they were just testing it out. And they were using a dark web called, uh, 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 a website called dark web, because it was not accepted by the government. It was a disruption, disruption. So uh, in 2010, Bitcoin moved from 0.0001 to 0.025 and the first open transaction of Bitcoin was done where a gentleman used 10,000 Bitcoin he spent 10,000 Bitcoins to buy two pizzas he 
it was on 22nd May 2010. This was the first open transaction that was done in the open. He spent $10,000, 10,000 Bitcoins to buy two, two pieces. Today, if he still has those Bitcoins, they will be worth I think Bitcoin right now is around 8,600. 8, 8,600. There it is. Nice. Uh, put 10,000 Bitcoins. So today, that guy ate wealth worth $87 million. To the time. Why? Because Bitcoin then didn't have a whole lot of value. It's only cryptographers who are using it. In 2011, Bitcoin moved from that and it was as far with the dollar. I met a lecturer, one of our former PS ICT. It's called Dr. Pitangan Demo. In the year 2010, he told some university students, Nairobi University, to buy Bitcoin when it was a dollar. You can imagine when you are in college, all you think about is hey, having fun, right? Having fun, right? So you're given pocket money by your parents instead of investing, you're just thinking of having fun. So most of them never got Bitcoin. That was in 2011. In 2012, Bitcoin went to a high of around $25, $30, but it had a low of $4. I'll use all time lows because this is where you invest in any assets. All time highs is when you liquidate your assets. Now, 2013 was the first time I heard about Bitcoin. It was around $80. I didn't make any investment, but the same year, one Bitcoin went to a low of 65. 2014, we saw Bitcoin at low at a low of 212. 2015, one Bitcoin was at a low of 178. I want you to check something. 2015 was the only year. Bitcoin has ever gone lower than the previous year's low. That's something to note, and especially for you investors. Because it will make sense to you when you understand why I'm explaining this. 2016, again, a friend of mine called me. One Bitcoin was at 580. The same year, it went to 235, a low of 235. 2017 is when everybody knew about Bitcoin. I remember I was in Canada, opened my laptop, I almost collapsed. <laughs> when I saw Bitcoin at $20,000. And this is where you start making maths. You know, you start calculating. Sleep is gone, and you think you've lost everything. Right? Now, the same year, one Bitcoin was how much? A low of 785. Last year, one Bitcoin had a low of 32.16 and currently, if you check, how much is one Bitcoin? 8,700. So you can check. There's a certain pattern that since Bitcoin started with all the apps, Bitcoin price has been on an upward Upward trajectory. I was sharing with my friends just the other day. If you had ten dollars, ten dollars in the year 2010, you'll have received four thousand bitcoins. And I'm sure if it was me, I don't think I'll be in this room. Truth be told. Truth be told. Because this equivalent to almost um, 30, 33, 34 million dollars, 4,000 bitcoins, 34 million dollars, close to that 5 million dollars. From how much? 10 dollars. That was in 2010. Now, I want to explain something, but have this picture in your mind, so that you can understand why, why this. Why has Bitcoin be, been the only currency that does not suffer inflation? Instead, it's been on an upward trend. Why? I'm going to explain this in the next slide.
Bitcoin sold two things. Number one, you can use Bitcoin as a measure or a medium, sorry, a medium of exchange. Like well, how we use fiat currency, government made currency. So you can use Bitcoin as a medium of exchange. When I was coming here, I bought my air ticket through chipia.com using Bitcoins. When I'm in Canada, even fueling my car, I use Bitcoins and cryptocurrency. In Kenya, we have restaurants that accept Bitcoins. We have spas that accept Bitcoins. You get. So you can use it as a medium of exchange. Another way you can use Bitcoin, you can use it as a store of value. And that's why you hear people say, it's a digital gold. It's a digital gold. You cannot see it, you cannot touch it. But if you had $10 in 2010, today you'll have $32 million, $34 million. So why has Bitcoin been in increasing in value since then? All cryptocurrencies have one unique element that fiat currency and gold doesn't have. They are limited in supply. All cryptocurrencies. They are limited in supply. So when Satoshi Nakamoto came up with the blockchain technology, uh, Bitcoins, he said that there will only be 21 million Bitcoins Ever. I remember when my friend was sharing with me this, the first question which popped in my mind was how can 21 million bitcoins be enough to service our 7.9 billion people? And the one thing I realized was scarcity. Anything that is scarce has one land, gold, diamonds. And so, Satoshi Nakamoto knew if he dumped all the 21 million bitcoins one time, two people could have gotten them. Maybe I was a cryptographer and he was a cryptographer. And he gets 10 million, I get 11 million. No more bitcoins. Right? So for it to suck it, a fraction of bitcoin is called Satoshi. Fraction of Bitcoin is called what? Satoshi. Let's say, for example, take me back to pre. Pre.com. So let's say, for example, I want to pay for this water. Maybe it's two dollars. Two dollars. <laughs> so I'll pay an equivalent of zero point zero 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 two two nine three. Well, of Bitcoin. I've bought myself water and I'm gone. Okay? Now, let's say, for example, I want to pay to buy a car worth $20,000. $20,000. So, I'll send somebody in Japan 2.293 Bitcoins. If I want to buy a property worth $200,000, $200,000, I'll send somebody 22.9 four bitcoins and if I want to send someone two million dollars two million dollars I'll send 229.5 bitcoins this is the most beautiful thing about bitcoin they are not that party it's from me to her that all I need from her is her wallet address no that parties and now this solves the issue of fees you be shocked when I tell you there's a day we sent one of our business <coughs> partner ten thousand dollars worth of bitcoins and the fee was zero point zero nine of a dollar. Most of the fees in cryptocurrencies are in cents, and that's the reason that's why today Satoshi Nakamoto is anonymous. Because he knew he was coming to disrupt something people have been making money in, which the banks, financial institutions like uh, Visa cards, Mastercard, they make money because they offer us services. What if we don't need them? 
What if I can do whatever my bank was doing using just my phone? The fees will dramatically drop. You get? So the fees will always go down. So Satoshi so Nakamoto knew if he dumped the 21 million bitcoins, there will not be value in it. So he came up with a protocol. A protocol for issuing bitcoins. Just like the way our government here does not print money in Hauli. Yes, they only print when it's needed. Satoshi Nakamoto came up with a protocol to issue bitcoins. And the protocol was set that it will start in the year 2009, January that, it will go until the year 2140. So we've done 10 years. We have 121 years until the last Satoshi is issued. Now, how does the protocol work? The protocol works in four years. The first years was between 2009 to 2012, where every 10 minutes, the protocol would issue a block of 50 bitcoins. We went to the second phase, 2012 to 2016, and every 10 minutes, the protocol would issue 25. We are in the third phase until May next year, 2020, where every 10 minutes, we are receiving 12.5 bitcoins. How much is that in crypt? 12.5 bitcoins, around uh, uh, $104,000 every 10 minutes. So as you're sitting over here, somebody somewhere is going to receive that. The protocol will issue them with bitcoins worth that much. And I'll show you in a few seconds. Again, next year, 2020, May to 2016, the protocol is designed to issue how many bitcoins every 10 minutes? 6.25. So you can see there's a sequence that is happening when it comes to <coughs> issuance of bitcoins. Every four years, bitcoin issuance always helps. Supply of it is going down. Supply of the 21 million bitcoins every four years goes down. Now, what happens to the demand of bitcoin? And we'll do it practically. Oh, who, how many of us knew Bitcoin between 2009 and 2012? Anybody? Anybody? Just one person. How many of us knew Bitcoin between 2012 to 2016? By show of hands. The three of us. How many people are we here? So all of us, the rest of us, we fall where? We fall there. So you can imagine, when he knew Bitcoin, between 2009 and 2012, it was a lot in circulation. Why? Because people didn't know about it. It didn't have value. And I give people a very good example. When people were exchanging gold for goods and services, it was readily available. Today, can you just walk into a shop and buy a bar of gold? A whole bar of gold? No. Why? Scarcity. And the demand of it has gone high. Now, you are so blessed because you are among the 6% in the whole world that have the information I'm sharing with you. What you do with the information is up to you. If you take good advantage of it, two, three years to come, you and your family will be in a good position to smile. Like I'm smiling. Okay? So, demand of Bitcoin has been increasing, and there's a short video I'll play uh, as, I, as, I, as I finish. Um, it shows why was I telling people when Bitcoin hit 3,000, please buy, buy Bitcoin. And some people will tell me, no, I went online, I researched, there's this guy who is saying Bitcoin is still coming down to, 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 to 1,500. And I tell him, it's not gonna come down. Bitcoin is not going to come down. Stop listening to them. Look at statistics. Numbers don't lie. Numbers don't do what? Lie. So as supply is diminishing, demand is increasing, law of economics. What happens to the price? 
So Bitcoin price is not pegged on the government or a few people to determine the market forces. Bitcoin price is just pegged on demand and supply. Period. Nobody can come and manipulate Bitcoin price. We'll have all the spikes, ups and down, ups and down. But at the end of it all, if you look at it, all time lows, the price has been on an upward trend. Upward trend. Now, who controls Bitcoin now that I've said it's not controlled by, uh, by government? Bitcoin is controlled by computers through algorithms. A lot of people ask me, who owns Bitcoin? And I tell them, it's us who owns Bitcoin. If you have a wallet that has Bitcoin, you own Bitcoin. It's not owned by a private party. It's just like internet. Who owns internet? If you ask yourself, who owns internet? This is story people say it's the US government. No, US government doesn't own internet. Internet is a network. You cannot own a network. What you do, you rent space on the network. So Bitcoin, if you have Bitcoins in your wallet, you are one of the owners of Bitcoin. And it's not controlled by government or anybody. It's for you to decide, do I want to hold it as an asset for years to come? Or do I want to use it to buy things on a global platform? Get it. So there are a few ways you can acquire Bitcoin. There's a few ways you can acquire Bitcoin. Number one. You can get paid. You can get paid. Let's say you're in a consultancy firm like we do in Nairobi. If we go for corporate events, I tell them I'm not taking dollars, I'm not taking Kenya shillings, I want bitcoins. Why? This is the only currency that, that does not depreciate in value. Do you know three months ago, if somebody paid you one bitcoin, Three months ago, it was at a low of 3,300. If somebody paid you in dollars, how much would you have gotten? As somebody paid you in a bill? Now, can you imagine somebody who was paid in Bitcoin, just on Bitcoin, three months ago? We are talking about today, the same Bitcoin is worth how much? 1,700. Have they made money? So you can get paid. So developed countries they have already accepted Bitcoin. I saw yesterday Microsoft have added Bitcoin as a on their chart. So you can search and do Excel, Excel sheet. Now you can search Bitcoin as part of your currency. So Bill Gates started accepting Bitcoins in 20, 2012, around 2012. 2012. So yesterday he accepted to add Bitcoin in Excel. This is one way. So you can pay or you can receive Bitcoins. You can pay or receive Bitcoin. Second way you can acquire Bitcoins. As an asset, you can buy. Now in the cryptocurrency world, we don't call this hold. We call it hodl. So you can hold and you sell when the prices are high. For a profit, just like any asset. So you buy land, you wait five, ten years, and then when the prices go up, you sell and you look for other assets, right? So this is another way. Now, for you to do this, you can buy Bitcoin either from an individual. Individual, you can buy Bitcoin from ATMs. We have Bitcoin ATMs in Kenya. We have one. We are praying and hoping before three, four months we'll have an ATM in our office also in Nairobi where people can come and buy and sell Bitcoins as it is. You don't need that part, you just come, you have your Kenya shillings, put in the ATM, scan your QR code, get Bitcoins, go. Okay. Or you can buy Bitcoins from what we call Bitcoin exchanges. These work as Forex exchanges. Where you, you have bill, you want dollars, or you have dollars, you want bill, you exchange. Now, I want you to have something in mind that these people, they buy low, they sell for profit. They're business people. 
So if you come today and you tell me you need one Bitcoin, of course I cannot give you one Bitcoin at 8,700. I have to do my markup. Because I don't know whether I should give you then. Then uh, before I notice, Bitcoin is at 10,000. <laughs> before I change then my fiat currency to Bitcoin, it's gone. And I'm like, I wish I never did that. <laughs> but again, it will be good because we have created a business relation. So number three way you can acquire Bitcoin. Number three way, and it's called trading. Part of what we are doing in our consultant consulting firm is to teach people how to invest in other digital assets. One thing I tell people: cryptocurrency space is not a get-rich-quick program. You don't put your money today and you expect tomorrow. And that's why they are called digital assets. That's why they are called what? That's why Bitcoin is called digital asset. You don't buy your gold today and you sell it tomorrow, thinking you will make a lot of money. No, it's an asset. You keep it for a long period of time. So we have some cryptocurrencies, some digital currencies we've been studying for the last one year, six months. And most of them are where Bitcoin was some years back. Do they have a future? Yes, they do. Can you invest in them? Yes, you can. Will you make some millions of money? Yes, you will. But you need to be careful when you're buying digital assets. You need to study the use case. What are they coming to solve in the marketplace? Will they be easily accepted? Okay, that's a lesson for another day. Number four way you can acquire Bitcoin is called mining. Now, the first time I heard about this is an engineer who was sharing with me about mining. And you can imagine what came up in, in my mind. Engineer, mining, you only think of excavators, huh? helmets and stuff, right? Right? That's what crossed my mind. I was like, yo, honestly, you want us to go and start digging for this thing called Bitcoin? But then he was quick to tell me, mining is just a fancy word that means verification of transactions. Verification of transactions. Now, I want to give you an uh, example. An example. So, what's your good name? Nah. Nah. How much money would you want to write for me as a check? As a gift? A thousand bill? A thousand bill is how much in cash? Uh, in dollars? It is around uh, twenty dollar. Twenty dollar? Okay. So here's my friend here, and he's writing me a check of how much? Around twenty dollars, right? Right? So I'll receive the cash in my account of the same $20. But in between here, we have banks. My bank and his and his bank. What's the work of these two financial institutions? They're just confirming that he has money in his bank. Lawrence has an active account. And when they do that, they call that clearance. And again, they charge us some fees. True or false? Yes. This is when you're dealing with fiat currency. Now, all banks have to report to a place called Central, Central Bank. Because Central Bank has to keep its book, books updated in terms of where the economy is headed. So the work of Central Bank is to verify all banks' records that they are not dealing with money laundering and stuff, right? They also keep the records. Central banks keep the records. And also, when they print new currencies, they issue new currencies. They issue new currencies to banks, and then you as a banker, uh, as, a, as a customer, you go and get new currencies coming in to the market. This is when you're dealing with fiat currency. This is when you're dealing with fiat currency. Now, when you come to the digital world, you come to the digital world, you need something called a wallet. And let's say, for example, I want to pay back him his $20 now in Bitcoins. So I'll send him Bitcoins all the same. $20, $20 worth of Bitcoins, how much? 0 0.002288. Okay, from my wallet to his wallet. 
So he received the same 0.002288. But in between here we have guys called minors. Now because you cannot touch Bitcoin, you cannot see it. They use special computers. Currently they are using a computer called Antiminer S9. The work of this computer is to confirm that I have bitcoins in my wallet. He has a wallet that can receive the bitcoins. And when that transaction is done, that's what we call verification. Now, one of the major key reasons as why cryptocurrencies came was to reduce the fees. We have some cryptocurrencies that are working towards that you can send even money for free. Right now, most of the financial institutions, big financial institutions, they are using Ripple, XRP, because the fees are almost cents in dollars. So they can send billions of money across countries between banks and pay cents in dollars. So they are already using that. So miners cannot survive in the sense of fees that are paid here. They can't. So every miner has to give a report to somebody. And this is where now I speak about blockchain. So if you Google what blockchain is, you'll hear it's an open distributed public ledger. Now with central banks, this is closed. I cannot go and ask, can I see that transaction? If I don't have authorization, I'll be chased. But most of central banks are always guarded with guns, right? You cannot even go close to the gate, right? By the time you reach over there, the soldier over there has given you a look to tell you, dude. Still, right? So with blockchain, it's online, internet. What is the work of blockchain? Number one, verify miners' records, keep the records, and issue new Bitcoin. So the protocol that issues Bitcoin every 10 minutes is connected to blockchain. Now, because miners cannot survive with the fees here, new Bitcoins are given to miners as a reward. If you are part of a mining company that does verification of transactions, you are the people who receive. Currently, we are the place where we are receiving how much? Can you remember? 12.5 bitcoins every, every 10 minutes. Every 10 minutes. Now, I want to take you to blockchain so that we can see it practically, right? So we go here. If I go to data and I pick on Bitcoin Explorer and then scroll down and pick on transactions there, I go down and say view more. So these are wallet addresses. Now you can see as we're seated over here, people are sending and receiving Bitcoins. You can see it's written. These are live updating list of new Bitcoin transactions. So as we are seated here globally, people are sending and receiving bitcoins. You can see we have over 13,000 and counting unconfirmed transactions. This is the work of miners. But then Satoshi Nakamoto knew, if I left people just to verify these transactions without a certain way, most of these transactions will have been missed out. So, and this is where he came up with the protocol of issuing bitcoins every 10 minutes. every 10 minutes. So what happens is that this will count until 10 minutes and all transactions that will be in that in the, that time limit they are put in one block. They are put in in one block and this is where the word blockchain came. Now currently I think we have only 13 mining companies and I'll show you how we can verify that. 13 mining, they are called mining pools in the whole world. Now, for you to start one mining pool, currently you need around $40 million to have a facility that can openly compete on blockchain. Now, what happens is this every 10 minutes, these 13 mining pools 
they openly come and compete. It's just like today, if I turn to be your teacher and I write a sum here, right? If I write a sum, all of you will go down and look for answers, right? Of course, one of you will raise their hand and say, I've gotten what? The answer, right? And if the half of the class agree that is the answer, as a teacher, I say clap for him or her as a reward. Now, what happens with blockchain is all these mining, 30 mining pools, they compete. Whoever verifies this transaction faster than all the rest, they are awarded with new bitcoins coming into the market as a reward. Another 10 minutes, another block is the issue. So this started in 2009. It will go until the year 2140, until the last Satoshi is issued. So when you invest in mining, I tell people, my son is four years old, he has four mining rigs. He's getting himself some Bitcoin. That's the most beautiful thing. Because there was a day I was asking my dad, no, my, my grandma, how come my grandfather never took uh, all big land when he was free? Yeah, yeah, I asked him because at the end of it all now I have to hustle and buy land for me. There's no land for us. He married three wives and he took a Finnish land. <laughs> <laughs> you know? So all of us have to plan ourselves and get what? More land. <laughs> True? So I don't want my son some years to come ask me that day. When these guys were talking about Bitcoin as a digital asset, why are you? <laughs> so I have to cover him. I have to do what? Cover him. So he's earning bitcoins. So these are the 13 mining companies. As we all say in Kenya, like joking saying, I think we are all Chinese in a way. We are all Chinese in a way. Most of the clothes we wear are from where? The shoes. Catrary at home. Uh, our roads are being made by. I think you're being turned to, ch to be Chinese in a way. <laughs> <laughs> so even when it comes to mining, China owns the whole lot of like 71%. Now, say with me, BTC.com is? China. F2 pool is? China. Ant pool is? China. Which this is? This slash pool is Swedish. Unknown, I'll share what unknown is. BTC top is? Via BTC is Bitfury is owned by Richard Branson. At least him he has the financial capacity to raise to raise forty million dollars. So most of these Chinese companies, what they did is that they held, they came together. We we come here, all the best. We raise money on the table, and we form BTC.com. Okay, we mine as a as a pool. We definitely go and compete with them. Okay. They also own ant pool. And then there's a slash pool. Okay? Even then they put resources together, they are mining together. And then behind there we have BitClub Network. Behind there we have BitClub Network. It's also a mining pool. Now what happens is this, these people they say, we no longer want anybody to come and join our mining pool because we are making so many Bitcoins. So we are private. They come and say, we saw BTC.com not accepting anybody, so even us, we want Bitcoins for ourselves, so we are private. And then also then they say, and pool and BTC, they're saying they are private as slash pool. We no longer want any shareholders, so we are also private. So currently in this chat, the only club allows you to buy shares is BitClub Network. It's a 2%. Now, what does 2% translate to? How many blocks are those? Twelve. What is twelve times twelve point five? <coughs> That's around two hundred and fifty. I think. One fifty. One fifty. Yeah, one fifty. So these are one fifty bitcoins, right? Let's go to print and see how much is that. <laughs> so Bitcoin Network has mined bitcoins worth over one point three million dollars. As a pool. Now, what BitClub is doing is this: we need to build a bigger facility for us to be more competitive. So they allow shareholders to also welcome other shareholders. 
as investors. You come, you invest with BitClub. Now, what happens is this 20% of whatever BitClub mines goes for operational cost. So, like I said, my son mines Bitcoins, right? But he doesn't even know. Why? Because he's not worried about the overheads or the upgrade of the machines or anything. All I did was to invest for him. He doesn't even know he's mining Bitcoins. Right? Now, 80% comes back to shareholders on a pro rata basis. <laughs> How many shares do you have with Bitcoin? Yeah. I was explaining what? Four ways you can acquire Bitcoins. Bitcoins. Now, why I use blockchain is one way. If today I came and I told you I have a bank called Lawrence, here in Addis. If I came and I told you I have a bank called Lawrence, would you believe in me? You will go to Central Bank and take what I'm listed there, right? <laughs> right? Yes. Second scenario, you have people who will come and tell you, oh, we do mining, oh, there's something called blockchain. I remember when I was asking my, one of my lecturers, because at the end of it all, I tell people, three years to come, the only thing that will matter is how many bitcoins Do I don't say my, don't say we do I have in my wallet? Some people will have finish, some people will have more, some people will have so much. So when I was asking my lecturer, how can I get as many bitcoins as I can? Because already I've understood these are digital currency that will be globally accepted. And the biggest thing is Bitcoin currently is being accepted by institutional investors. When I started researching about Bitcoin, all big banks in the whole world were telling people stay away from Bitcoins. Now you understand the reason as to why. Who remembers post offices? Who can remember the last time they sent uh, a letter? Last time you sent a letter? I think I was in high school, so many years ago. So my lecturer told me the reason is is because Bitcoin is not a friend to them. <laughs> so Bitcoin will do to banks what emails did to post office. If you can remember when you sent a letter, think about it. When emails came, it was not a threat to post office. You were still continuing sending letters, right? But today, same letter you can send at the palm of your hand. So, same case scenario. Soon you won't need to visit your bank. All you need is a phone. You buy your air ticket, you buy your food, you buy you pay for your tuition. You do everything from the comfort of your house. Why? Because Bitcoin is the fifth evolution of money powered by blockchain which is the fourth industrial revolution <laughs> so as i finished and i welcome my business partner who i really learn a lot from him i want to play a short video, short video and before even he plays i want to explain something and have this in mind as you think about accumulating bitcoins and why i do mining why I buy and hold and why I invest in other digital assets is because of to expand my portfolio. In mining, currently I have done $15,000. It's called a dealership. He'll explain more on this. I want to invest that $5,000 in mining. Because I know when Bitcoin price goes up, you mine more. You make more money, right? So I have to make sure I maximize because there's no time. And I'll tell you why we don't have time in this video. This is a video which was done two, three days ago. And I was telling my friends, you guys, you need, you need to notice that when institutional investors came on board, the window of opportunity became teenage. It became teenage. So some of us will go do research before you realize Bitcoin is at $30,000 and you're like, oh, you get it. So there's something I wanted to share with you. I was reading an article 
why Bitcoin is on a bullish trend right now from 3,000 three, three months ago to 8,000 close to 9,000 and this article was saying something over the last one year and a half we have 21 million Bitcoins that will be issued until the year 2140 that one we know right now out of these 17 point something million have already been issued okay they've already been issued <coughs> now the last one and something here 10.5 million bitcoins have never been moved what do i mean they have never left one wallet to another wallet what is happening these guys have taken these as assets So, which leaves around 7 million bitcoins in the market? Right? Now, out of the 7 million, we are all thinking of acquiring 3 million is lost. Lost and gone. So, how much are we, how, how much do we have currently in circulation? Less than 4 million. Last year, I remember I used to go to seminars and I'm telling people, you'll never see Bitcoin at this price again. And guys will ask me, how? Why? I told them, the sharks, the whales have come for the digital asset. The whales have come for the digital asset. And I'll give you a very good example. Fidelity, JP Morgan, Goldman Sachs, New York Stock Exchange, Barclays Bank, Standard Chartered, City Bank. Where does that leave me and you? We are only left with a very tiny space of accumulating at least some fractions of Bitcoin before you cannot afford it. Last year I read an article that 2019 would be the only year the public can afford one whole Bitcoin. <coughs> now, when they were writing that article, Bitcoin was around 35 thousand dollars for one now today we are talking of eight thousand seven hundred how many people can afford that so it's still running away from us public so we don't have time my brothers and sisters you see this is an opportunity you can invest in please 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 don't delay i need bitcoin at eighty dollars when i share my story it's not that i feel so good because I remember a friend of mine from Australia told me, Lawrence, let's put a thousand dollars each. I went to research. You are not clear away how you could get Bitcoin or how you could sell. Right now, I'll, I'll show you. You can use an individual. You can use an ATM. There are Bitcoin exchanges. So there are so many clear ways how you can buy or liquidate your Bitcoins. It was not clear five years ago. And with that, I say thanks. Uh, as I conclude, I want you to watch this. Uh, as uh, I bring the MC back again. So thanks for being such a good audience. I really like it. The, the energy you gave me was amazing. You're amazing. So just play the video. Thanks so much. I will bless you with a crypto coin. I'm going to take back in 2017. Spike surging 52% in a month. Bitcoin now appears stuck at the 8K levels. Investors wonder what the next big driver could be. Who better to break it down than our very own Bitcoin baller, Brian Kelly? What could it be, Brian? Well, there's a couple things going on, so let's break down what has what the market's been to anticipate. First of all, you're starting to get that long waited for institutional adoption. So that fidelity is rolling out institutional custody, they're getting customers, people are starting to buy institutions. Retail anticipation. We saw from TD Ameritrade. They invested in RSX. They're going to start opening crypto trading, Bitcoin trading to their retail customers over the coming months, perhaps three to six months or so. People are anticipating that. But the big picture here is we're starting to enter this cycle where you get a supply cut. Every four years, the supply of Bitcoin gets cut in half. You generally have a rally a year into it and a year out of it. And so we're just at the beginning of that stage. So you've got this combination of a lot of demand coming in and we're heading into a period where we're gonna have supply cut and that's generally very bullish for it. But one last thing on that, just as a PSA, while we're down at these levels, 
please size this appropriately. It's a risky thing. One to percent of five port, one to five percent of your portfolio. And when it goes higher and you buy it at the top, don't tell BK that I bought too much. Buy it here. That's called that is it 